Today's Tech Byte podcast explores the world of threat intelligence, that is, information on active and emerging exploits, zero days, attack techniques, and more. Sponsor Fortinet provides threat intelligence to customers via its FortiGuard Labs. FortiGuard Labs analyzes billions of global security events daily. It distill those events into actionable information for network and security teams, and they also use those events to inform security updates to its own products. Our guest is Derek Mankey, head of FortiGuard Labs, the threat intelligence and research organization at Fortinet. Derek, welcome to the podcast and, and kick us off first. How does FortiGuard Labs get all this data that it's analyzing? Well, there's not there's not a silver bullet here. We get we get our data from a lot of sources, but our core data source uh, with FortiGuard Labs, we've been building actually for 20 years. Uh, mm-hmm. So that, that it's a big network. We call this a FDN, a FortiNet distribution network. We have over 6 million sensors deployed worldwide and uh, and, and we're getting information coming back, not just not just security logs, but a lot of information on attacks, right? Where What, what attacks are happening? Where are they moving? Where, what are the hottest vulnerabilities? And we're starting to look at look at that data and pull it into uh, in, into the big machine, right? So this happens very frequently. We get over 100 billion threat events a day, and, and it's no easy feat, right? This is a, um, what I call pseudo real time, because there's no such thing as real, true real time, but we're getting this coming in, into our labs uh, really on a per minute basis uh, worldwide. So when you say sensors, are you talking about Fortinet firewalls and other security devices, or does Fortinet also have its own devices out on the internet just collecting data? Yeah, actually uh, a bit of both. So we have we have a lot of our uh, firewall, flagship firewalls that are reporting data when customers opt into it, and about 75% of our customers do. Um, but it's actually our security fabric. So we're talking about sandbox. We're talking about uh, deception products, right? We have a, a whole gambit throughout the fabric that is able to report different data. And so we have to take that data in and normalize it, of course. But we're also uh, doing um, threat hunting. So we do a lot of threat hunting, dark, uh, dark night infiltration. We do uh, honeypots as well, right? Trying to collect zero day samples too out there. So that implies that you've got quite a large operation because if you're all of those things that you just mentioned are, are pretty much unique skills. This isn't like, you know, today I'm going to go troll the dark web for the latest information. That's just a whole skill set on its own. In fact, probably a whole team of its own. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, uh, completely agree. And we actually have uh, we have specialists in different areas. So as an example, if you look at the makeup of the team, we have over 300 people in our, in, in our FortiGuard Labs SOC mm. that is analyzing this data. And it's a divide and conquer uh, mechanism. So yeah. we're looking at mm. viruses as an example. That's a unique skill set. We have reverse engineers just looking at viruses and mm-hmm. You know, Windows malware is different than Linux malware, as an example, right? Then we also have a team, a small but powerful team of zero-day researchers, too. Uh, so that's, you know, we uh, in that zero-day research team, we're actually going out and proactively finding zero-day vulnerabilities. In fact, um, you know, I helped write this program back in 2006. Since 2006, we've discovered over 1,000 zero-day vulnerabilities. That's a mm. lot. We're working with over 100 different vendors mm. to patch their products proactively. And that's just a small part of that that 300 makeup uh, of the team. Right. Then, of course, we have, um, as I said, threat hunters. We have people also looking at the dark web piece and and so forth. Um, and, and so we're, we're constantly cross-functioning these teams together because every threat is not just about a virus or a vulnerability. Yeah, I think the key thing to take away here is that you've got a substantial commitment to this threat intelligence business. You're not, a lot of companies take a threat intelligence feed from somebody else and then feed it into their product. But I think there's real value in, say, having the threat intelligence capability inside your organization and using that to directly feed into your products. There's like, I've always joked that companies should put a finger, put a ring on it. You know, if you're going to partner with somebody, you're probably better off having it in-house because there's definite synergies in having that threat intelligent feed inform your entire product design process. Yeah, absolutely. And having it in-house has less roadblocks as well, too. We don't have mm. to wait on a third party and because we have to move with speed with a lot of this data, mm. of course, to process it. Um, we do have to have, like, when, when we find a new a new uh, virus, a piece of malware, as an example, we have to um, work with other teams to make sure that we're getting the proper detections in place too. Mm. And of course, this is all about escalation paths. As they said, we have a hundred billion threat events coming in a day. Of course, we can't just mm. tackle that with, you can't tackle it with 3000 people. So we have to process this. We have to normalize it, uh, uh, separate the signal from the noise. So we actually have working environments where we have escalation paths with uh, AI, true machine learning models. Actually, we have well over 20 different machine learning models in place that help to pick up the interesting bits and then escalate that, mm. uh, you know, in partnership with our human analysts. And so this is the way that we work. It's not siloing or separating these. It's actually working all together with these models. And I guess the unique thing here is that 
this threat intelligence is integrated with the firewalls at Fortinet cells today. So your um, intrusion protection system, intrusion detection system, or the endpoint software or the SD-WAN, you can take this threat intelligence and include it in the Fortinet tools that you have today. This isn't separate or an isolated product that comes as an extra product. This is all integrated. Absolutely. In fact, if you look at FortiGuard Labs and step back and look at the big picture, it is the the brain and also the heart of, of, of our security fabric. It is mm. front and center. It's integrated. All that processing and the normalization that's happening in the middle to make sense of this intelligence, that gets translated into actionable controls. And exactly right, as you mentioned, this is transparent to the customer and the end user, right? By getting FortiGuard subscription services, this goes into no matter what product you have, and most of our products support FortiGuard subscription services that they're able to integrate that, update that again mm. uh, on, on a, you know, we, we do pushes out of threat intelligence every five minutes to our global customer base. That's how active this is. Mm -hmm. And uh, that intelligence is getting integrated and it's able to effectively mitigate and block and detect new threats as well, too. Because so, well, I basically what I would do there is I would go into a firewall, add the threat intelligence capability, and instead of configuring rules by IP address, I would say if an attack matches this group block or drop or something like that is that how is that or drill into that for me well no this is the whole point you don't so we're trying to take out the mundane day-to-day -day stuff from a security operation perspective so we don't want to have humans doing the, the basic things like that policy configurations adding adding or dropping a rule for an ip address because those things are, those things are cheap they change every every five seconds it's just that that's an uphill battle you're going to lose right so the whole point of this is, is transparency right uh, so that it comes it comes in uh, transparently and that it can be applied so that the human operator isn't having to do that in fact what it's the uh, what happens is that the fabric takes care of all of this itself mm. right so you just subscribe to the services you get the updated intelligence coming into the fabric it takes care of all of that mm -hmm. so that when you have a real big problem i.e you're act you're under active attack and you want to know why is this a problem what do i do about this that is what that is that is where the intelligence right. actually escalates it up to the, the SOC resource so i could just be like in my appliance just say turn on the security function and let all of that intelligence data feed into a firewall rule set. So, I mean, as we record this, we're facing an elevated security environment. And I mean, we always face an elevated security environment. Mm -hmm. But really, this is about saying my existing technology, which has already got the control points, you know, you, you're feeding data through it. Maybe you're using SD-WAN, but your security is in the network. You can just add this and all of a sudden, your actually your posture suddenly elevates. Absolutely. And in that posture, you get enhanced visibility and you actually get enhanced mitigation uh, capability as well, too. So it's extremely important, right? Because I always say you, you can't protect against what you can't see, right? It's an invisible enemy. But So when you say mitigation, what do you mean? Because I would think that you could block it or are you just saying we flag it and then wait for the operator to work? Or can I just automatically enable a rule and say, if I match this category, just block it? Or is there some, am I missing something? Absolutely. This, this this can be all automated, right? This is the point. So, and, and in fact, there's default configurations that we decide within FortiGuard Labs based on our expertise, so that you don't. It takes the guesswork out of the out of the uh, the analysts in the security operations center. Now, a few times with FortiNet, we've talked about security fabric. Is this part of that that idea of the FortiNet security fabric? Is the idea that the whole security system draws together? Is this part of that capability? Absolutely. And this is this is the actionable integrated threat intelligence of the fabric. So the fabric itself will talk to each, uh, you know, integrates with itself in terms of security controls policies. But the intelligence of FortiGuard Labs piece is core to that. Right. It's the updated dynamic intelligence that is actually giving the guidance and making the decisions if it's configured that way, of course, to to do all that automation and apply those rules uh, on that behalf. And the fabric essentially means that if I've got Fortinet products, a, a firewall, endpoint security, IPS, whatever, they're all sort of working in concert together. They're aware of each other and coordinating on enforcing policy. Absolutely. And, and we also have to remember that within the fabric, of course, it's all, it's all about Fortinet products, but we also interoperate. We have fabric ready partners as well, a big list of them. So we interoperate with other products through protocols, you know, supported protocols that we've set up as well. So the integration piece actually extends, right? We're, we're trying to cover end to end uh, from, you know, endpoint all the way to data center. Okay, so it's not just a Fortinet story. You've, the fabric extends to third parties. Absolutely. Hmm. So you've talked about using threat intelligence to inform you know, the security capabilities of my security devices. Are there deliverables I get from this service that are more for human consumption, for analysts, for network engineers, for security pros, just wanting to get a general sense of what the you know, threat environment or the threat landscape looks like? 
Yeah, this is this this is the beautiful piece of it, right? So we take we there's more than one action point on one bit of intelligence, right? So we just talked about the automation, that's the uh, the mitigation and, and the security controls. We also take the same intelligence and we contextualize it, and we have multiple different ways that we're actioning on this. So as an example, we create um, weekly threat intelligence briefs, and this is not meant to be a you know five page brief. <laughs> Uh, hurt your eyes and strain your eyes every week because not everyone has a lot of time, of course, right? But quick briefs: what's up? What's happening? Are you are you seeing this? Um, do you have uh, the proper controls in place? We also release threat signals. These are campaign based. When there's a breaking threat, a ransomware threat, we have a, a quick again one pages. We put up about two to three of these a week, right, um, mm-hmm. to, to give guidance on what we're seeing from Forty Guard Labs, what you should do. Then we have a wider scope, so biannual threat and uh, threat landscape reports, as an example. So this is all for human consumption. Um, on top of that, I should say, we actually do threat intelligence sharing too, human to human, right? Where we actually um, have analysts talking to analysts. We share uh, this information also uh, to, to security operations centers too. Mm. And I understand you just put out a new threat report? Yes, yeah, we just released our second half of 2021 uh, threat landscape report. Yeah, I read those, by the way. Um, I actually make a point. If if you're a, a professional, IT professional, and you're not reading threat landscapes as a sort of a regular-ish thing, then you're probably not fully aware of what's happening around you. It's not like you can be up to date to the minute. That's why you have a threat intelligent feed. But just an observation that there's so much that you can do by being um, engaged and and knowing what's actually happening. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this this report, you know, we, we have the fun job of taking half a year's of data and thinking about 100 billion events a day. <laughs> That's right. You know, multiply that by half a year and and uh, crunching that down into this report to make yeah, it do a 20 page report. So, it's pretty useful, yeah, though, because yeah. what it does is it gives you an overview of the major attacks and gives you. A, I find that reading these, which is something I actually do, believe it or not, gives me a sense of where security is moving to. Like if these are the attacks, what are this? What is the security industry reacting to. And so having free access to this, like a lot of people actually pay big money to companies for this sort of data, yes. um, yeah. like hundreds of thousands of dollars to get access to these reports. And it's actually, to be honest, having read others, this one's just as good as those. Absolutely. Yeah. No, you hit on a good point. This is a, this is free. Uh, we do this because we want to make it more expensive for the cyber criminals to operate. So this is just our way of of helping with that disruption, right? Because the more that we can actually show what's happening on there and expose them, and then also add, you know, some some good uh, suggestions in there so that we can, stack, you know, raise the elevation on that security stack, that's what we're trying to do. And there's a lot of interesting things, of course, that, that we uncover with this too. Yeah, I'm guessing if you're covering, if the latest one covers the last half of 2021, that Log4j probably plays a big role in, in the latest report. Yeah, no surprise there. So Log4j, and we called this out in the report, it it moved with incredible speed. Speed was a, a main theme of this report. And comparatively, if we looked at, you know, in the first half of 2021, we had a proxy log on with the MS Exchange. It was also a group of vulnerabilities. Big at the time, it was about a year, like almost a year ago that it broke. Like looking at the difference in speed that these two moved, because that was significant as well. Log4j moved actually 50 times faster in its 10-day span it had more volume and prevalence than any other threat in, in, in the whole second half of, of 2021. So it really just shows when you have a some that perfect storm, right? A big attack surface, an easily, you know, relatively easy to exploit vulnerability. It's going to spread literally like wildfire, and that's what mm. we saw. Okay, so you know, we talked about the example of Log4j, which is a specific attack. Did you does the, did the th- uh, reports cover anything about how attackers are, you know, what they're up to, as opposed to just the specific nature of the attack? Yeah, so we're constantly innovating with new views, and we have a brand new view. Actually, in the last two reports, we've expanded on it, and we're actually showing the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So these are TTPs, techniques, tactics, procedures. This is showing the toolkit of -hmm. attackers and their preferred choice, because there's, um, you know, literally thousands of different ways they can move, and this just hones in to create a heat map of just, you know, the top 10, essentially, what we're seeing. And yeah, what what we saw and called out on the report, if we look at the execution phase, so how, how they're executing code, as an example, we saw that 42% were executing through APIs and another 19% on scripting. It's showing over 60% it's done through automation now on code. Rather than, as an example, we also saw 21% uh, user execution, so waiting on the user to click on a link or make a move as an, as an example. Mm-hmm. It's really showing that they're moving towards weaponization of automation uh, to execute their code. And, and no, no surprise, we also saw a heavy focus on the defense evasion tactic. 
Um, so there was about five different techniques that accounted for a, a vast majority of the ways that they're trying to get around security controls. So by us highlighting that and understanding it, we're able to actually effectively close those gaps. It's also a research piece in that way. It's really important. Mm. So if folks want to find out more about um, uh, FortiGuard Labs or get their hands on this report, where should they go? Absolutely. So uh, you can go to fortinet.com slash FortiGuard slash labs. It's the best one-stop shop. All right, that's fortinet.com slash fortiguard slash labs. We'll also have that link in the show notes that accompany this podcast. Uh, this does wrap up our time. Uh, thank you, Derek, for joining us. And thanks to Fortinet for being a sponsor. As always, thanks to you for being a listener. If you like this show, you can find it and many more fine free technical podcasts along with our community blog. It's all at packetpushers.net. You can follow us on Twitter at Packet Pushers. Find us on LinkedIn and rate us on Apple Podcasts. And last but not least, remember that too much networking would never be enough.